And the real star of this trilogy is again revealed. Palpatine has twisted both sides of the civil war he created. He better be written about in Star Wars universe history books. And my guess is that the heroes on both sides line is pointed at Dooku. The Separatist movement was actually a noble movement if it hadn't all been orchestrated by Sidious. I praised Attack of the Clones opening scenes, but wow is this just above and beyond. Obi-Wan and Anakin's little role together that does more history building than a lot of the last film, from around the silent ship into a war zone, all done in one continuous beautiful take. And it's a space battle unlike we've ever seen or have seen since where it's very clear who's who. Everything is in this shot, including a kitchen sink. In addition to being extremely fun, the battle towards Grievous' ship goes a long way in softening Anakin to us. I'm gonna go help them out. And also solidly confirms Obi-Wan's line in Episode 4 about him being a great pilot and ups the ante for their final confrontation. R2, hit the bus droid, center eye! Is that a callback to Phantom Menace? Oh, I have a bad feeling about this. But again, you shouldn't! This is some of the best 20 minutes of Star Wars ever! It's something I didn't point out in Attack of the Clones when Mace Windu does it with Obi-Wan, but I love that the Jedi always work their way towards each other to protect each other's backs. It's just fun to watch skilled, experienced warriors with a long history together. I sense a trap. Next move? Spring the trap. I may have spoken too soon in the last film. Maybe their friendship was built during the Clone Wars. There's so much evidence of them fighting side by side for a long time in this movie. And they seem to enjoy themselves. Oh, it's you. I know there are both EU or legends and canon explanations for Grievous' origin. He was either a warrior that Dooku blew up and turned into a cyborg, or he chose to become a cyborg slowly to compete with the Jedi. It doesn't really matter to me. When I saw this, I thought, hey, cool, what about the coughs? That's new. It's not every day that seeing someone covered in oil and then lit on fire brings me so much joy. So kudos for that. Anakin, don't you think you're wearing a little too much black? It's like you think the dark side is cool. Maybe I am going to a funeral. Wait, what, what did you say? Obi-Wan just sort of walks his lightsaber into the super battle droid, always finding fun new ways to kill metal. As visual exposition, I love Anakin's scar. He's not a kid anymore. He's been through a war. And whether Ventress gave it to him on Yavin or not canonically doesn't really matter. Do it. And let the darkness begin. We got Palpatine finally letting his Emperor growl slip and the stressful silence cut by lightsabers sliding against each other creating an unnatural sound that makes your teeth hurt. Oh, and a beheading. He was too dangerous to be kept alive. I need you to keep that line in your head. Deal? Deal. Such amazing attention to detail. Even the background battle maintains continuity even though it's in the background and blurry. Leave him or we'll never make it. His fate will be the same as ours. Saving your friend one last time. R2 to the rest, yeah, never mind. Finally a normal drone bad guy that can compete with the Jedi. Man, two beheadings in six minutes. But sometimes losing your head is the best way to get a head in line. Gives a new meaning to buzzing the tower. 23 minutes and 34 seconds of pure, beautiful Star Wars. From the epic space battle to the saber duel and beheading of Dooku to Grievous' escape to the crash landing on Coruscant with this awesome zoom in on the bridge glass. What an amazing opening to this film. And that's the Millennium Falcon. It's funny because RLM actually credited this film for not having the Falcon in it. Oh, maybe he didn't actually watch the movie. And you killed Count Dooku and you rescued the Chancellor carrying me unconscious on your back. All because of your training. Recognition and respect all around. Hugging and more Leia buns. I'm pregnant. Just a little proof that Hayden Christensen can act. He goes through all the emotions he would be experiencing after that news in a few seconds with barely any words. This is a happy moment. Moment of my life. And whatever happened in the last movie, I do believe their relationship now. Anakin Skywalker's workout routine. Phantom Menace showed us a boy afraid to lose his mother. So afraid, the council said he shouldn't be trained. Attack of the Clones showed us that boy losing his mother and giving in to revenge. Now we see a man having the same fears he had as a boy about his wife. But as he promised his mother in Attack of the Clones... I won't let this one become real. Close to you? Yes. And now we jump immediately to him seeking the Jedi Council's guidance. But he can't even be honest about what his fears actually are because of the Jedi Code. And the lighting on his face is stunning as he shamefully moves his eyes in and out of shadow. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. While it's easy to agree with Yoda's bumper sticker wisdom, he offers no solace to a man who's made a promise. Let go of everything you fear to lose. Basically, deal with it. I'm appointing you to be my personal representative on the Jedi Council. Another flawless step in Palpatine's plan. He specifically puts Anakin on the council to cause discord and create more tension between him and the Jedi, especially Obi-Wan. A little cloud turmoil in the background to symbolize the turmoil Anakin is going through trying not to let his selfishness take over. Council wants you to report on all the Chancellor's dealings. They want to know what he's up to. This is something as a viewer we sort of passively accept because we know he's a Sith. 
But the Jedi Council has no clue. At this point, they just don't trust him as a politician. This is one of the many things the Jedi Council does to shake Anakin's faith in the Jedi Code. It's deceitful, dishonest, and just sort of sketchy. You're asking me to do something against the Jedi Code. And that's the important response. All Anakin has is the Jedi Code. It's the thing that keeps him from turning every situation into a Sand People Massacre or a Dooku beheading. Without it, well, just constantly impressed by Digital Yoda, from the way he rubs his head to the light glow through his ear, really grounding his skin in reality. First generation walkers and Republic ships that are like first incarnations of the Imperial Star Destroyers we get to know later on. Do you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? So this is probably my favorite scene in this film. It's the first time Palpatine opens up about his true origins, though it goes over Anakin's head, but more importantly, he's able to not only give Anakin the answers he wants to hear about saving Padme, keep the ones he cared about from dying, but he also waters the seeds of Anakin's doubt that he already had in the Jedi Council. They asked you to spy on me, didn't they? All who gain power are afraid to lose it, even the Jedi. The Jedi use their power for good. At this point, almost playing devil's advocate, hoping there's some truth to what he's been taught. He could save others from death, but not himself. Ian McDermott manages to congratulate himself in front of someone he's keeping a secret from. This was his trilogy, but this is his movie. Harry? Of Harry and the Hendersons? He was a Wookiee? All right, just one wife anecdote today. She decided while watching this movie that George Lucas must have pulled children for a lot of the different alien names in his films. Wookiee? Ewok? Jawa? Anyway, Wookiees! I've disappointed you. I haven't been very appreciative of your training. I've been arrogant, and I apologize. Sincere apology win. Heartbreaking, really. Anakin isn't some power-hungry psycho. He's not pure evil. At this point, there's only one extra power he wants. All he ever wanted was to please Obi-Wan, obey the Jedi Code, and save the ones he loved. I have taught you everything I know, and you have become a far greater Jedi than I could ever hope to be. And Obi-Wan finally offers him the approval he so desperately seeks as the last time they see each other before their battle. I now truly believe Obi-Wan would have considered him a good friend. And as Obi-Wan walks out into the sun, Anakin makes him stop and speaks to him from the shadows, again his face in darkness. That is Bruce Spence, the gyro captain from Mad Max. Find blown. Boga the Varactyl, or let's be honest, giant Komodo dragon iguana lizard mount guy, is a win. Alright, so a little defense of this action. Number one, Jedi have been known to have precognition, and based on Grievous' reputation of wanting to fight Jedi one-on-one, -on -one, it was a fair assumption for Obi-Wan to know that he'd be safe. But also, I always thought it was a diversion so the clone troopers could sneak in while everyone else was paying attention to their duel. Indiana Jones ain't got nothing on Obi-Wan Kenobi. The Force is kind of like a gun. Alright, I'd be scared of Grievous. But when you consider the only real reason he can even compete is because of cybernetic body parts and multiple swords, you start to understand that being a Jedi is more than just knowing how to wield a lightsaber. Without the Force, he might as well just be another droid. Another awesome vehicle, giant wheel for high speed that has retractable legs for stabilization? If one is to understand the great mystery, one must study all its aspects. And this is what proved to be the fatal flaw of the Jedi Council and why they were so easily deceived. I'm not saying you should embrace darkness, but fear of knowledge blinded the Council. Know thy enemy, anyone? And Palpatine continues to play it perfectly, revealing himself and then swiftly reminding Anakin why he was curious about the dark side in the first place. And you will be able to save your wife from certain death. All right, see you, Obi-Wan. You have to... <laughs> I love that that's in there. He could have force kicked him, but in a moment of adrenaline, you might forget that your enemy is made mostly of metal. And a unique battle victory for Obi-Wan, even if it is a little... Uncivilized. If the Jedi destroy me, any chance of saving her will be lost. Even at this point, he's still torn. He wants to save Padme, but he's still submitting to the Jedi. This dialogue-free scene is such a big moment in their relationship, illustrating the growing divide and the uncertainty in Anakin's mind until he finally decides what's most important to him, and that he will do anything to stop her from dying, even turn against the Jedi if needed. Master Windu. I take it General Grievous has been destroyed. In the name of the Galactic Senate of the Republic, you're under arrest. And the ultimate failure of the Jedi. You suspect he's a Sith, so you refuse to answer his question or even give him the opportunity to step down. I'm not saying he would have, but we'll literally never know. Power and speed like we've never seen. Cuts down three masters in a few seconds. He's too dangerous to be left alive. What did you just say? Did you hear that? Do you remember that line I told you to remember? You don't? Fine, here it is. He was too dangerous to be kept alive. So what's the difference between the Jedi and the Sith? 
I tricked you a little because the even more important line came after from Anakin. I shouldn't have done that. It's not the Jedi way. It's not the Jedi way. The reason his turning point works is because other than the myriad reasons on the surface, mostly saving Padme, he realized there was no difference between the Jedi and the Sith, just a certain point of view. I will do whatever you ask. Just help me save Padme's life. And people get upset because of his quick turn with that line. My only guess is that people started watching the movie right here. This entire film has been building towards that moment. He just helped kill a leading member of the Jedi Council. The life he knew is over. He chose Padme and now he has to stick to that choice. Henceforth, you shall be known as Darth Vader. The hair on the back of my neck stands up every time. Execute Order 66. And Order 66 Jedi murdering montage is the fastest way to depress the crap out of me. And make me hope every single time leading up to it that it might play out differently. But it's also the fastest way to lose your head to Yoda. Yeah! This also seems like an extreme step, but this is why he does it. I want you to go to the Jedi Temple. Show no mercy. Only then will you be strong enough with the dark side to save Padme. Sidious implies he must do evil things to gain dark side power. It's time for you to leave. And so it is. I know Lando did much worse, but does anyone else get a Lando vibe? Jimmy Smits is always gonna land on his feet. Fun fact, this is the same kid that interrupts the librarian in Attack of the Clones, and he's Lucas' son. Goodbye, Chewbacca. It's sad they never get to see each other again. If only Luke spoke Wookiee, they could make fun of Yoda's speech patterns together. I just... What is wrong with our culture that senators don't wear capes everywhere they go? Seriously. Of all the places we've gone back to from the original trilogy, Bail Organa's ship might be my favorite. Just the nostalgia of seeing the ship where Vader would first walk through the door into our lives. Another insanely detailed world with some practical provisions like the force fields on the structures as protection from the lava. Wouldn't be Star Wars without remote control cars fleeing from someone down a hallway. So much yup. I'll never get tired of watching Yoda cut fools down. I've gotta give ILM another win. Anytime there's direct lighting like this, it presents a challenge to make full CG characters look present and they constantly nail it with Yoda. The juxtaposition of these two scenes intercut with each other is amazingly ironic. While one is physically killing unarmed people, the other is doing the actual damage by creating the Empire with just words. Anakin is the father, isn't he? I'm so sorry. John Williams, when will you stop impressing me and adding to one of the most already emotional scenes in the film? You and Natalie's performances in this scene always make my heart hurt. Vader finally gets a moment to reflect and maybe has a little regret, but realizes there's no turning back now. I am more powerful than the Chancellor. I, I can overthrow him. Down a reactor shaft, and now we see how the taste of power has corrupted Anakin. He never set out to rule the galaxy, but now it seems attainable and the quest for power goes beyond his desire to save Padme. And thus begins one of the most entertaining and powerful lightsaber duels ever. People complain that Anakin should easily overpower Obi-Wan, but if you notice, Obi-Wan is on the defensive most of the fight. His biggest strength is knowing that Anakin is more powerful. And this is actually them dueling. It's not sped up or digital at all. <laughs> Can't really say why. I think a lot of you might agree, but that's my favorite bit of saber choreography in all of Star Wars. It's so powerful you are. Why leave? Man, I love Yoda. And then the epicness gets taken to a whole new level. Literally. And not to say that Obi-Wan doesn't have his moments in the fight where he matches Anakin, as there would be such an ebb and flow in a duel like this. Uh, bringing Duel of the Fates back one last time for the most remarkable battle is an amazing way to close out this trilogy. Ian McDermott again manages to add a new level to the Emperor's insanity, cackling throughout most of the battle as if he's just embracing every emotion he can grasp. Dude. Not only is this duel fantastic, but the environmental danger is at a whole other facet to the fight. This battle had to be this, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. The showdown the entire trilogy has been leading towards. The last time they meet is young men in their prime. But my bucket of lava, I'll lose my job. Oh, fine. Anakin, Chancellor Palpatine is evil. Although Obi-Wan is right, he still can't even consider what part the failure of the council played in all this. You underestimate my power. And that's the main fatal flaw of the Sith. Faith in their own power, even when they should know they're beaten. My brother Anakin! I loved you! And that line should always bring a tear to your eye. No matter what they'd been through, Obi-Wan always loved Anakin. How poetic is it that Luke and Leia are being born as their father completes his transformation into Darth Vader? Also, that's the Empire symbol. Something I've always found interesting about this scene is the timing of Vader's birth and Padme's death. Vader was dying, and Palpatine had promised him they could find a way to beat death together. 
What if, in his struggle to stay alive, Vader used the dark side of the Force with Sidious' help to actually take Padme's life from her so he could live? None of this broken heart nonsense. It would be perfectly fitting for the actual meaning of the Darth Plagueis story to have the opposite outcome. Vader's life was saved. Sidious never said how it was done. Also, other than flat out lying, something the Emperor doesn't seem to do much or at all, how else would he know Padme was dead? In your anger, you killed her. And whether this is evidence of Anakin and Padme both dying to give Vader life or just Anakin dying and Vader being born, his heartbeat stops for a good 12 seconds before the mask seals. You can't unhear the beat once you notice it. Also, man there's a lot going on in this scene, how about that smoke being blown away from Vader's first breath? Unbelievable detail. To Tatooine, do his family send him? I mean, it's kind of like hiding in plain sight. Why would Vader ever want to go back there and relive his mother's death? It's a pretty good plan. An old friend has learned the path to immortality. What a surprise! The Jedi who disagreed with the Council at every turn is the guy who discovers Force ghosting! And protocol droids mind wiped. What? Ha ha ha, no one can understand me, so they don't care. Tarkin! If I need to explain, you must just not really like Star Wars. Yeah, let's split them up. One can be a princess on an Ansel Adams photograph world, and the other can be a moisture farmer on a desert slave planet. Although, Alderaan does blow up, so it all evens out in the end. Iconic imagery and music is iconic. Let's get this right out of the way. This is not a bad movie. Revenge of the Sith has a strong story and developed character motivation. It's not perfect, but it's far from bad. And let me stop you right there, RLM quoters. It has nothing to do with how dark it is or how long the lightsaber battles are. Though it is humorless for long stretches and the duels are amazing. Films can have mixed tones. It's something that adds to its complexity and intrigue. Scorsese and Kubrick come to mind as directors who constantly mix tones. To insist that every film should carry a consistent tone throughout is pure nonsense. This film is about the death of Anakin Skywalker and the two sides vying for his allegiance that failed him. It all started with his fear to leave his mother and ended with him ironically fulfilling his own prophecy and losing Padme. So on the surface, this trilogy has been about that. However, the more important part of Darth Vader's creation is in the failure of the Jedi Council. From the beginning, the Jedi Council has done nothing but let Anakin down. His master all but initially despises and or is jealous of him. Then Mace Windu breaks the Jedi Code that has been oppressing Anakin from the very beginning, while unknowingly threatening Padme's life in the act. So it's as much the fault of the Jedi's failures as it is Sidious's manipulation that Anakin falls to the dark side. Ultimately, it does end up being Anakin's choice, but can you blame him? If you have to choose between two corrupt ideologies, why not go with the one that promises to save your wife? Now I'm not saying the Council didn't have the best of intentions, although as much as I love Mace Windu, his were a little suspect. He really seemed to fear the Council's loss of power in the Senate. But the real failure of the Jedi Council is actually more systemic. Their suppression of emotion, their fear of the dark side, going so far as to not teach anything about the dark side. And this completely paradoxical line from Obi-Wan is the encapsulation of their arrogance and blindness. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Here I go picking on Obi-Wan again. That statement is an absolute. I know it's not technically dealing in an absolute, but he does immediately draw his sword after. So... I'll give Obi-Wan a little leeway given the circumstances, but it's exactly what the Jedi Council taught him. From this movie, we learn the true power of the dark side is their willingness to embrace all of the Force, not just one side. Jump forward 30 years and, spoilers, Luke defeats Vader using anger. But because he was taught by Obi-Wan and Yoda, two of the last remaining Jedi alive, whose perspectives have shifted, he's able to see that light and dark are not absolutes. He doesn't magically become a Sith because he successfully harnessed the power of the dark side. And in the moment he throws away his lightsaber, Vader finally learns that lesson and is redeemed. Anakin never had that option as the Jedi Council would have expelled him and maybe put him to death for helping in Mace Windu's killing. Does the Jedi Council have the death penalty? Anyway, I started this trilogy talking about the differences between Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon. The irony of this trilogy is that you could say that none of this was Anakin's fault, and a more appropriate title for this film would have been The Tragedy of Anakin Skywalker, or The Women I Love and How They Destroy Me, or Legs, Why Robotic Ones Are Better. Obi-Wan never learned the truths that Qui-Gon was trying to teach him in The Phantom Menace. Instead, as he puts it, I have failed you, Anakin. In a lot of ways, Obi-Wan is responsible for Anakin's trip down the dark side. On one hand, he was too hard on him as a Padawan and then loved him too much and was too attached to him once he became a Jedi to see what he was becoming. He is like my brother. I cannot do it. Had Qui-Gon lived, Anakin may have had a different experience with a more lax teacher. In fact, who's to say the Jedi aren't the ones that mucked up the prophecy by trying to control everything in the first place? With Qui-Gon showing Anakin the ways of the Force, Anakin may have felt comfortable enough to tell him about Padme. Then, Anakin wouldn't have needed Palpatine, and when Palpatine tried to seduce him, he'd have just said, nah, Qui-Gon told me about the dark side, and it sounds like a bunch of dumb tricks, so, nah. And together, Qui-Gon and Anakin could have destroyed the Sith. Obviously, no Darth Vader, no Star Wars, but it's interesting to think about. But that's a Star Wars theme, failed father figures. 
Obi-Wan failed Anakin, who tries to turn Luke to the dark side. In the end, Obi-Wan gets another chance to be a father to Luke that he wasn't to Anakin, and he takes a much more relaxed approach. If you listen to commentaries and watch the behind-the-scenes footage for these films, you know that George Lucas didn't sit in a chair behind a monitor surrounded by yes-men. Lucas was involved with every tiny little detail and had everyone on his staff questioning him constantly. And Lucas would often give in, like with this saber throw. He initially thought it was too much, but let his team convince him. The biggest failure of the prequel trilogy is ironically the success of technology that wasn't quite perfect yet. The nostalgia of stop motion was replaced with mostly realistic looking CGI and fans were upset. George Lucas has nothing to apologize for. He told a compelling and complete story and regardless of how we interpreted the original trilogy, his vision has been there from the beginning. Going through these films with a critical eye has changed even my opinion. And I like the prequel trilogy to begin with. I know their technical failings. I cringe with everyone else the occasional ridiculous dialogue. But this is a case where the sum of its parts far surpass its weakest pieces. Ian McDermott kills. He encapsulates evil in a way not often seen, and like I said in the beginning, his plan was executed masterfully. The final duel between Ewan and Hayden gives new depth to Obi-Wan and Vader's confrontation in A New Hope that didn't exist prior. The first act was visually amazing and allowed us to get a little more humor in between our heroes. Grievous was another unique villain, and there were more than a handful of some really emotionally moving scenes that rank amongst the best in the Star Wars saga. I hope that you can enjoy these films for what they are. Marvel at the CGI, rejoice in the small victories, and understand the larger story that's being told and sets up the future. I'm gonna miss this trilogy. I'll need to take a couple years off so I can come back and enjoy it again. And now we have Gareth Edwards helming Rogue One. So prepare for any lightsaber battles, blaster skirmishes, or dogfights to be swiftly cut away from so we can get back to the human drama. Just kidding. Although when one of those people delivering the human drama is Hannibal Lecter, I have no complaints. Here's to hoping Galen Erso force eats someone's kidneys. So uncivilized. 